the highs of Eurovision. There are definitely lows. Again, I ended up crying in a TikTok booth because I was having a breakdown over not putting a hyphen in the metadata. But (laughs) yeah, it's very stressful, all of it. (laughs) It's such a small thing, but when you're in such a high pressure environment, that's kind of the things that will get you, you know, but at the end of it, you just kind of forget all the negatives and you're just so ready to do it again. (laughs) Yes. Shutter Stories, a canon podcast. Hi, I'm Ilvin Jokicin, I'm a Canon ambassador and you're listening to Shutter Stories, a podcast by Canon where we talk to inspiring photographers, content creators and filmmakers. Heavy metal, drag queens and the Eurovision Song Contest, those are just some of the incredible subjects that today's guest has captured. And she's probably going to mention a few bands, so if you're on the lookout for some new music, keep your notepad close. Corinne Cumming has shot stars from RuPaul's Drag Race, world-famous musicians like Linkin Park and Billie Eilish, and is now head of photography for the iconic Eurovision Song Contest. And we're speaking to her ahead of the competition kicking off. Hi, Corinne. Hello, hello. How are you? Hi, Elby. I'm okay, thank you. How are you? Um, Well, thanks so much for being uh, on today's episode, because I know it's a very hectic time for you. You are preparing to go to Eurovision. So how are you feeling? Yeah, I am. I am very stressed. I can imagine. For the people who don't know Eurovision, uh, the competition has been running since 1956 and it has a very rich history. So could you maybe explain a little bit more about it and your connection to it to the listeners who might not be as familiar with Eurovision? Okay, so Eurovision is once a year. Um, It's a big kind of festival of music from across Europe, but also we have Australia in there now. Um, It's just kind of like a celebration of music. Everyone comes and submits a song that then gets put through its paces. You have this first semi-final, second semi-final and a final. It's been running for all those years, but the only year that I think it skipped was uh, 2020 in the pandemic that year got cancelled. So yeah, it's just, it's a lot of fun. Uh, It's people from all over the world coming and descending on one city for a couple of weeks out of the year. And this year, Eurovision is in Liverpool in the UK. Oh, so quite nearby. Yeah, unfortunately, Ukraine won last year and should have been hosting it this year because those are the rules. If you win, you host. But because of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, the UK was asked to host as the UK came second. And so that's why Liverpool is hosting this year. I see. So what will you be doing in the upcoming days in preparation? What's on your to-do list? Oh, so much. We have a big (laughs) content team meeting tomorrow because some people haven't met before. Some people are brand new to the team. So that's the first thing we've got to do. That's tomorrow. And then all the other stuff I have to do is organizing, getting equipment to the arena, organizing my set designer to show up and build my set for my backstage photo studio, organizing all of the borrowed kit that is coming. So yeah, there's just, there's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. That is a lot to do. Mm. I can imagine it's very, very stressful. So you're now the head of photography. Yes. How, How did this come about? That's an amazing achievement. How cool is that to be the head of photography for such a big event? Yeah, I definitely didn't see it coming. Um, (laughs) So last year when it was in Turin, because uh, Maniskin, who people might know of, because they're one of the biggest bands in the world right now, they won Eurovision in 2021, which meant that 2022 was in Turin in Italy. And I was brought in to just be a photographer on the team. There were three of us. And kind of as the weeks went on, just because I'm quite a practical minded person and I'm very good at organizational skills and stuff like that. It just ended up that I ended up kind of organizing things throughout the two weeks and doing some planning and stuff. So it just kind of made sense that this year I take on a more organizational role and basically do more of the pre-planning coming up to Eurovision as well as sorting out my team and making sure that we're doing 
what we need to be doing on site if that makes sense yeah yeah wow that's a big job and but you'll also be photographing so it's both or yeah yeah so um my team is me there's sarah louise bennett and there's chloe hashimi and so i will be doing the rehearsals the opening ceremonies the semi-finals the finals but also backstage i have a photo studio being built for me so i'll be doing some portraits backstage and then sarah will also be doing the semi-finals finals rehearsals opening ceremony all of that but she will also be doing portraits in the opening ceremony we have plans for another portrait session there and then chloe is kind of our hybrid shooter editor and she will be both shooting all the stuff that we're shooting minus the portraits she's not doing portraits but she's also going to be while we're on the finals night where it's live and televised we're going to be dropping in our photos to her to edit to send straight out to press and media and whoever it needs to go to so that they can go out quicker basically yeah so it's faster oh while you're saying this i can kind of feel the nerves coming back i've done eurovision early on in my career twice and it was nerve-wracking to me because there's such a big hurry in getting the images out when you work for media so which countries did you do which ones were they I went to Oslo and to Baku, Azerbaijan. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. But we'll get into that later. Before we do that, I would really love to learn a bit more about, yeah, about you as a photographer. Can you tell a little bit about the stuff you also like to shoot and what makes you tick as a photographer? So, yeah, how did your career kind of start? Okay, so I started out when I was kind of, 16 17 shooting really amateur metal bands in basements in camden basically and i loved shooting music i actually always loved shooting in general i loved taking photos and my family like really noticed that i loved doing that so when a photography gcse came out uh i was like yes i want to do it but my art teacher said that i wasn't good enough at art to for him to think that I'd be good enough at the photography GCSE because I wasn't I was rubbish at art I could not draw at all I have no creative bones in that kind of way uh-huh. do you know what I mean uh-huh yeah yeah um, this sounds familiar <laughs> before I found photography I also always thought I'm not creative yeah but I'm just not I just can't draw it's a different thing apparently yeah <laughs> yeah not all creatives are the same kind of creative but that's something I kind of didn't know at the time I didn't understand I was like oh yeah so I'm, I must be rubbish at this then if he says I'm going to be rubbish at it but my parents had bought me a little kind of point and shoot camera I don't even know what it was but it had a lot of different modes because they thought I was going to do this photography GCSE which I didn't end up doing but I used that camera to take photos of my friends bands and then I upgraded to a kind of little bridge camera and was taking more photos of my friends bands all through kind of college and stuff but when I got to uni I didn't study photography I studied geography because nobody in my Uh, family had been to uni yet so it was kind of on me to be the first one to go because I was quite academic at school so I ended up going to Kingston which is a town in South London I used some of my student loan to buy a Canon 1100D so the cheapest one I could get at the time I think I paid 400 pounds or something for it but that was a lot for me and I went to, there's a a record store in Kingston that's really famous now. It's called Banquet Records. And I said, hey, do you need a photographer? And they said, not for gigs, but we have a club night that, you know, can you, we'll pay you 20 quid to come and shoot it. And I was like, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I started shooting for them. And um, as a perk, they let me shoot like the bands that came through. So we had the 1975 when they just released Chocolate. We had Maximo Park, Bombay Bicycle Club, Bastille, all that kind of stuff come through. And I just loved shooting music and kind of getting better at it. Because yeah, all my life I've loved live music. Uh, From when I was a kid, my dad would take me to live gigs. Cool. So yeah, music is really like where my passion is at. What a good start. But I also do, um, you know, studio shoots. I have my own studio in Hackneywick and um, 
I also work with a lot of drag queens, um, started working with them kind of five or six years ago. And now the baby queens that I met then are now on Drag Race. So wow. it's kind of amazing progressed for all of us, you know? Cool. I saw that on your Insta. Those portraits are so amazing. Thank you. It just looks like so much fun. And just all the energy in just one image is, yeah, people yeah. should really go check it out. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's really fun. You, I mean, there's never a dull moment with drag queens, really. Um, but also <laughs> the fact that I think I've I think I've I've got like quite a clear style in my drag portraits now, which is just kind of really bright, really colorful, really energetic. Um, and so, yeah, it's just it's just really fun. I really love doing it. Yeah, you can really see there's a lot of energy during the shoot. You can actually uh, see that in the images that come out of those shoots it just looks extremely energetic and the bright colors make it even better they're yeah they're really beautiful so out of this time doing the music photography and the drag queens and all the subjects you worked on in the past years what were some of your favorite moments that is like asking someone to choose a child (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's not the easiest i have so many favorite moments I mean, oh, you can name a few as well. It doesn't have to be one. Favorite moments. <laughs> uh, okay, so like my number one favorite moment has to be coming off stage after shooting Kalush Orchestra having won Eurovision last year. I took their winner's photo and I was running on adrenaline. I, I like came back to my laptop, picked the pictures, sent them off to press. And then as soon as that was done, it was like the adrenaline kind of left my body and I just bawling um and sarah who is my number two she's also one of my best friends and i was just like we were just sitting there crying because it was just such a release um my parents facetimed me i was crying on the phone to them i can imagine because they were having a like watch party with my aunt and uncle and um yeah it was just that's got to be my number one like nothing i don't think Anything has been as good as that. And I think it's a great thing as a photographer to cry, to be honest, because it means you care and that you're actually opening your heart to the things that are happening in front of your lens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I genuinely do this job because I love music. It's the thing that really like drives my passion. Um, And over the last two weeks, I've been to a lot of gigs just for fun. I went to go and see uh, Jonas Brothers at the Royal Albert Hall. I went to see um, Paramore twice. And I just went for fun. I didn't take my camera. And it just really, you know, brought it back to me. The reason why I do this, it's because I love music and I love live music. And that is why I shoot music, you know. Um, There's just nothing that kind of... It must be the... The dream job for you to, I mean, to love music like that and then to be able to make it your career. Yeah, because the thing is, I can pinpoint the moment that I realized that this is a thing I wanted to do. I was 13 years old and my parents bought me two tickets to see Panic at the Disco at the Roundhouse on their Pretty Odd Tour. And they bought them for me as like a present for doing well in my SATS exams. And I remember going and seeing all these photographers in the photo pit and I didn't know that was a job I didn't know that was a job that people had I didn't know that was a real thing and I was like oh my god that has to be me I want to do that and I was 13 and I only had a point and shoot at this point in my life you know I didn't didn't really know anything about cameras. I still haven't had any formal training on cameras. I taught myself everything off of YouTube. <laughs> wow. Do you know? But that's, so. but that's when you want something. You can really, when you work hard, you can create it. I actually have been in quite a similar experience where I never knew what I wanted to become. And then I figured out photography is a job. And I was like, really? People get paid to do this. You can do this every day of your life and it's your job. And I had a similar experience where I just knew right away, okay, this is going to be it. It's just amazing that... What was it for you? What did, what was your point? Well, I, I remember being in a, in a photography class, but in high school. I knew when you were studying math, you can become like something like with math or whatever. 
But with photography, I never figured out it was a job. And then the teacher told me. He basically said it. Well, this can be your job. And I was like, really? I just knew it right away. I loved like taking pictures. And then I knew that's going to be it. It's beautiful how you then taught yourself photography. That's even better. What challenges did you face in those earlier moments of your career or even a bit later on? I think really the hardest part is finding the paid work. And I think a lot of people will tell you that too. There's so much work going around that nobody wants to pay you to do. You know, there's lots of small bands that they don't have money to pay a photographer, but they want photos and you just want to take photos. So you make concessions to take those photos knowing that you're not going to make any money or you're going to make very little money, you know? So that was really hard. And I guess, you know, when I finished university, I said to my parents, give me a year to prove that I can make this work, that I can make photography a job for me. And if I can't within a year, then I will like go and try and find a job in geography or something using my degree. I don't know. But By the time I finished uni, I had gotten in with some clubs. So I was uh, the in-house photographer at Camden Rocks, which used to be a festival and a club night. I was also in-house photographer at Dingwalls in Camden, which is like a really famous venue. Same with the Barfly, the Underworld, uh, Borderline. These are all really like quite famous venues in London. And so because I had these connections and I was earning a little bit of money shooting club nights predominantly I wasn't getting paid very much to shoot gigs but I was getting enough money from club nights that I could afford to you know not work in Weatherspoons anymore for five pound fifty an hour and not go and have to get in quotes normal job and I you know lived at home so again my parents were like until you're making enough money we won't charge you any rent. I was like, great, perfect, because I'm not making enough money. I think that was really difficult. And I guess then the next part that was really difficult was the fact that I had to shoot club nights. There's a reason why you don't go to clubs and see female photographers as the club photographers. And it's because there is a lot of sexual assault and harassment that I had to deal with on a, you know, multiple times a week because I needed the money. And there were some really, really bad incidents and you know, the the very last bad incident, I was like, right, within three months, I don't want to be doing this anymore. And within a month and a half, I wasn't. I'm so sorry um, that you went through this. And I know from personal experience, as women uh, photographers, we really put ourselves in more vulnerable situations at times. Um, yeah, what what are your experiences, for instance, of touring as a music photographer? Yeah, I don't have very extensive uh, experience on touring. It kind of, yeah, goes back to the fact that music photography specifically is a very male-dominated industry. Back when I started shooting, I don't know, I'm 28 now, so I kind of properly started taking it seriously, I guess, when I was kind of 17, 18. And back then, bands did not take women on tour. It just really wasn't a thing. You know, I would ask my friends' bands and they would say, oh, our girlfriends wouldn't like it if we had a girl on tour or touring is an environment for, like, guys to be guys and it's, like, gross and blah, blah, blah. So my first experience of touring was with um, my friend Jack Bennett and he had his own project called Grumblebee. He's now the singer in a band called Lonely the Brave. And he took me out on this really fun tour, had the best time. It was him, his dad was driving us, and then it was his like drummer and his bassist. (laughs) And we just had the best time. But it really, um, the tides have really changed in recent years because all I ever wanted to do when I started was be a touring photographer. And it just wasn't going to happen for me. So I had to make the decision to settle down again in inverted commas because I now have commitments at home, uh, which kind of keep me away from touring, I guess. I can take a tour when they come and if they're really great opportunities, I will take them. But I've now built up kind of enough work at home and, and good clients at home that actually going on tour is not, as financially viable for me anymore 
But the great thing is now there are photographers, there are female photographers that are out there going on tour with big bands like Isha Shah and Pearl Cook and uh, Federica Borelli and Jenny McCord. And there's just so many female photographers now that are able to go out on tour with these big artists and, and big tours. But I think it's because there's been a shift in the way that artists and bands look at their touring crew. I now look at tours and if I look at an end of tour photo and there aren't non-white faces, non-male faces, I'm just like, what are you doing? Yeah, very true. I'm very happy it's changing. It really, I've, I've been doing this for 15 years now. And when I started, this, this moment seemed very far away. And it's really beautiful that it's here now, that it's closer, that there's more female photographers and more diverse. I mean, it's a much more diverse group in general. So shall we go back to Eurovision? Sure. Your next My big favorite event. topic. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite topic. <laughs> I really, really love the vibe at Eurovision. For me, it's very, I don't know, a bit nostalgic in a way. Um, difficult to describe. Can you maybe describe a bit of the vibe that you feel during Eurovision? It's like nothing you can experience. I feel like the only thing you can really liken it to is like the Olympics and stuff like that because they're huge events that really bring people together, you know? There are very few events and places where you would have so many people from so many different countries, so many walks of life, all coming to celebrate one thing for two weeks, you know? You can feel it. There's like a lot of excitement, a lot of stress, a lot of nerves. Although they do say that excitement and nerves are the same thing in your body. It's just about how you interpret them, I guess. So um, it's so nice because everyone is lovely. Everyone is so excited to be there. You get to the end of it and you are like, when, how how quickly can next year come back round? You know what I mean? It's it's like, it's addicting. It's addicting. It really is. You, you are just counting down the days until you're back there again and the the like the highs of of Eurovision. There are definitely lows. Again, I ended up crying in a TikTok booth because I was having a breakdown over not putting a hyphen in the metadata. But oh, yeah, it's very stressful, all of it. <laughs> it's such a small thing, but when you're in such a high pressure environment, that's kind of the things that will get you, you know? But at the end of it, you just kind of forget all the negatives and you're just so ready to do it again. <laughs> yes, I totally understand. Is it different for you preparing for your normal shoots compared to uh, the Eurovision now? Are you more nervous? Does it take a lot more? Or are you always, for every shoot, still kind of charged, nervous? It depends. I would say when I'm doing a big shoot for a new client, I'm always, I've always got nerves because you kind of want to do your best for the new client, you know? But the more you work with that client, when you get kind of asked back to do more shoots for them, the nerves kind of lessen because you kind of know what you're walking into. I have to walk into a new job almost every single day of my life, whereas people with normal jobs walk into a new job every few years if they change jobs, you know? The nerves that you have walking into a new job for freelancers is a completely different kind of thing because you are putting yourself out there every time you, you take on a new job. But the thing is with Eurovision, I think if you're prepared if you're like a good level of prepared before you go and you trust your team, like I trust this team that I have picked so implicitly, you know, and they're great. I mean, even today I was, you know, giving them information about, you know, when the coach is leaving and all this kind of stuff. And they were asking me how I'm doing. I said, I'm a bit stressed, but it's okay. And they were asking me how they could take things off of my plate, what they could do. I will probably get there and take for granted that I have a team that I can give instructions to and they can get on with it and also know that if something is thrown up at them at the last second and they they don't necessarily always need to come back to me for confirmation or whatever, I trust their judgment. 
Do you know what I mean? That's really, really like worth its weight in gold. I can imagine, I don't want to be too biased, but being a photographer myself, I kind of know how difficult it is <laughs> to manage photographers. I, I can imagine this role as the head of photography kind of adds to the stress also because you're photographing as well at the same time. Yeah, I guess for me, it's because I've picked them. I'm sure that on teams where you don't pick them, last year, obviously, I didn't pick the teams that I was picked to be on the team by my bosses. And so when you're working with people that you don't know, you haven't picked, that is where, you know, sometimes things can be a bit more difficult, but you kind of work around it and all that kind of stuff but because I've had the opportunity to pick this team it takes away a certain level of stress I'd say I'm at least 20 to 30 percent less stressed <laughs> coming into this so that's um, good yeah I I mean and I can you know I can delegate and my main thing going into this was I really wanted people with no ego because I'm sure you know, there are people in this game who would think that being a hybrid shooter editor is beneath them or going and doing some just pictures of, you know, people outside coming in or, you know, nothing is beneath anybody. I I'm happy to go and do any of those things. And so is any of my team. And I don't want people to say, I'm not doing this because this is beneath me. We're a team and we do it together. And by one person taking on this thing, it means the other people can go and do the other thing. And I just think that that's the most important thing to me. I just wanted a team where nobody has any ego and no no job is too small. That is really, really important. <laughs> What a good strategy from your side, because I think otherwise it will be become very stressful very quickly. And it's already stressful enough to do a big event like this. So how, how much of your time do you think you'll spend on photographing Uh, compared to managing? I actually think that managing is like going to be a very small percentage of my time um, because I plan to Good. kind of, yeah, <laughs> I plan to kind of, <laughs> until we've gotten kind of the rehearsal schedules through and all that stuff, I can't be sure how we're going to organize our time, who's going to do what. So I think it's going to be one of those things where as uh, like, we'll kind of take it day by day, um, you know, and see how it goes But I know that I will be shooting every single day, probably all day. Um, and then when I'm not shooting, it will be editing, it will be retouching, it will be putting metadata in, it will be putting it into the CMS, um, uh, that kind of stuff. But we're all going to be doing that. We all take, um, you know, a portion of that, basically. So we'll all be hmm. putting... And no sleep. I'm not hearing sleep anywhere in the... In the... Well, it, <laughs> it feels yeah. like a 24-hour... Hopefully this year will be less, I'll get more sleep because number one, our hotel is directly next to the arena. Whereas in Shirin, it was a 20 minute uh, coach journey from our hotel to the arena. So the coach would come at 8.30 in the morning and say if I didn't need to shoot anything until 11, I still had to be on that 8.30 coach because I had to just get into the venue the same as everybody else. Whereas now, because our hotel is directly next to the arena, All we have to do is walk literally two minutes from the hotel into the arena. And it also means that during the day, we have a lot of kind of, especially on the show days when we get into the second week, we get kind of gaps in the middle of the day between rehearsals and they can be quite a few hours long. We'll have, you know, the afternoon rehearse preview that starts at something like 12 and finishes at three. And then we'll have the evening show that will start at something like eight o'clock seven or eight o'clock or something and finish at 10 so the ability to be able to go back to the hotel room to have a nap if we need to change if we need to sit and do our editing in somewhere quiet where we're having a bit of alone time to recharge our batteries is genuinely going to be invaluable this year yeah that will be very important super important to have that kind of time and not to be on a bus or in the press room the whole time waiting uh yeah that makes sense so are you packing your camera bags already <laughs> and what will be in the kit bag more importantly so i haven't started packing it yet but i know what i'm taking um so i have two 5d mark fours the r5 i've been very much enjoying the r5 
but it's making my retouching very difficult because now I see every single pore, <laughs> which I didn't <laughs> use to true. on my Mark IV. <laughs> this sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, I did a photo shoot for Comedy Central last week and I just sat there and I was like, oh God, I can see every flake of skin. I have to get rid of all of it. <laughs> um, that's the only negative I have for the R5. So too much detail, but do you know what? I love it. It's amazing. Um, I'd rather have too much detail than too little. So then I have a 100 to 400 lens. Uh, all of my lenses are Canon lenses. Uh, I have a 70 to 200 f4, a 24 to 70 2.8, a 16 to 35 2.8, and I am borrowing a 600 5.6. What I'm hearing is that you're not bringing any unnecessary things. It's really all the lenses you would need, I can imagine, Yeah. from this kind of photography. Yeah, I mean, last year, because of COVID, we didn't have um, nobody, there wasn't like a, a pit of people in front of the stage. It was seated in front of the stage, right? So... Um, usually at Eurovision, you know how there's the stage and then you have fans standing in front of the stage with flags and stuff like that. And then you have the green room. Last year, there were three rows of benches in front of the stage and then the green room. And that was it. So it meant that we were much closer to the stage last year in Turin than we will be this year. And the 100 to 400 last year was enough, but I, it's not going to be enough this year, which is why I've asked for the 600. I mean, as it is, last year, all I took was one roller bag and just a normal backpack for my laptop because it doesn't fit in the roller bag. This year, I'm going to have to take my roller bag and my camera backpack because I'm not going to be able to fit it all in just one roller bag. It's going to have to go in two. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, that wouldn't fit with those lenses. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> so are there any specific tactics that you employ to kind of get the best out of a show doesn't matter if it's Eurovision or any of the other music shows like what do you what what's the trick <laughs> what are the tactics you Ooh. use I f oh I feel like there's like it's one of those things that the more you do it the more it becomes muscle memory I'm sure that you feel this too that when you're shooting something that you're so used to doing your fingers just do the thing uh, and so, so it's I was, difficult to explain. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's genuinely a lot of practice. The thing that I'm going to come up against at Eurovision is the fact that I've only recently switched to mirrorless. So it's not quite muscle memory for me yet. And also I'm switching between a Mark IV and an R5, which have two different setups. So I keep accidentally pressing the record button uh yes. instead of I do the same I'm working all the <laughs> with time. the same set I do too I do too I have the 5D Mark IV and a R5 same like you and I do exactly that I think I'm like trying to change the ISO <laughs> or something or, yeah. or f change the focusing or whatever I'm doing and I always press the recording every time you'll have some nice little videos <laughs> from Eurovision some snippets I mean uh my plan is in the next year to also upgrade to the R6 um the version 2 that's just come out so um you know that will be my next that will be my next purchase for when I'm shooting things like um club nights and stuff because I I still do those I just only do the queer ones so um you know there's a very famous venue here called the Royal Vauxhall Tavern. It's kind of a really iconic queer venue. It is where one of the UK's most beloved people, Paul O'Grady, he used to perform there as his drag alter ego, Lily Savage. And back in the 80s, in the height of the AIDS epidemic and the crisis, um, when the police came and decided to raid the Royal Vauxhall Tavern. He was performing as Lily Savage. And uh, when they came in with gloves on because they were scared to touch gay men at the time, he said, are you here to help us with the washing up lads? You know, like it's a really, it's a really iconic venue. And it's so like deeply seeded in queer communities. Um, and so, yeah, I will, I will work in venues like that still now. But if you're shooting 
bands, I think it's always good to see if you can have a look at the set list beforehand. Because if you don't know the band, you can listen to those songs, get a feel for it. If you're not familiar with shooting music photography, the rules are three songs, no flash. So you go into the photo pit, you get the first three songs of the set to take your photos, and then you have to leave. You know, having a bit of an idea in advance of what you're uh, what you're going to be shooting um helps i would say and also if other photographers have shot this band on another leg of their t- on another bit of the tour so say you're in london and they've been in birmingham and cardiff beforehand i will sometimes you know look at other people's photos and go okay so the lighting was like this or do you see what i mean so you can just kind of have a feel for how well or how badly this is gonna go for you (laughs) (laughs) well it's great to know like what kind of light is going to be there because with music photography and I, I haven't done much of it but I know the things that I have done <laughs> some of them were very much overexposed or underexposed because it's like a very dark lighting and then all the bright lights go on and I wasn't prepared for that and then I was still kind of figuring out the settings with of my camera and then the first three songs were over and it was like okay bye <laughs> and I remember just feeling so frustrated. I'm, oh, wow, was this it? In the beginning, I didn't even know that rule about the three songs and the no flash. And I was, I mean, you figure it out very quickly, of course, but I didn't in the beginning. So I remember my first concert, I kind of missed that important thing. How do you kind of navigate that? Because it's so short, three songs. I I have to admit, that I now work for people that mean that I sometimes get the whole set. <laughs> <laughs> That's so... how you navigate it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, That's so the for... best way. <laughs> it, I mean, it is, it is. But I mean, you know, I still, you know, still have to shoot stuff that is within the first three songs or whatever. But I feel how I work around that is I think, okay, so I need to shoot enough for a gallery. A gallery is 10 to 15 photos and then maybe one or two photos to go in print. So I will sit there and think, okay, 10 to 15 photos, that's what I need to get out of this. Um, uh, And I'm not one of those people that kind of presses the shutter down and just like takes loads. I'm very intentional with when I press, you know, my shutter button. So I I know a lot of photographers really don't like doing this, but I kind of have a look as I'm going. because I just kind of want to make sure that like I'm getting what I'm what I think I'm getting. I do know a lot of um, live music photographers who don't do that and prefer not to have a look at the photos while they're shooting. They prefer to just keep going. But I I don't really work that way. Um, but I guess now I'm really lucky in that I don't I don't have to necessarily only shoot first three songs because I work with magazines and artists and brands that sometimes let me shoot the entire set and not just the first three so at Reading Festival last year I managed uh, I work for Fender Guitars and they made it so that I could shoot the whole of Bring Me the Horizons headline set which meant I was the only photographer in the pit when Ed Sheeran came out to do Bad Habits oh. with them uh, which was wow. really great because <laughs> you know uh, Ollie Sykes's clothing brand got in touch and gave me some free clothes. <laughs> oh, beautiful. That's a good extra of this job. <laughs> so I know this is going to be a difficult question, but what would be one of your favorite images that you've taken? It is really difficult. Um, in terms of portraits, uh, last year at Eurovision in Turin, we did the opening ceremony and like turquoise carpet event in a beautiful palace in the middle of kind of the Turin countryside. And they had this beautiful hall. It was so, it was just stunning. And it wasn't in the plan when we started the day, but I just started taking portraits of all the artists coming through that hall in their outfits that they were wearing for the for the opening ceremony. And one of the last artists to come through was Spain's artist and her name was Chanel Torero. Um, She was wearing this beautiful red dress and it just, 
it's just so it's so stunning and she looked insane and I kind of got down on the floor and had the dress coming towards me so I had really shallow depth of field towards the front and then had her up the top in focus and I I entered that picture into a into a competition and I named it a river of Chanel because she just looked like it looked like it all flowed from her and I think that's probably my favorite portrait I've ever taken um yeah it's just it's it's there's something about it that just really like makes my brain fizz <laughs> <laughs> um so for anyone listening now who really wants to know like how did she do it what would be your advice a few pieces of advice for people who want to start out in this specific part of the industry see this is the thing that's really hard because i was um i don't know if my advice that i that i used to give pre covid works now you know before covid i would say email your local venues and like see if they need a photographer to shoot this that or the other email your local bands and say hey if you're at the very beginning of trying to do photography for bands email your local bands and say hey can i come and shoot your show in exchange for a photo pass or whatever but i don't know that the infrastructure is necessarily there because independent venues are shutting down by the day small bands are finding it harder because the cost of living is increasing and you know it's it's just hard for everyone all around so i'm not sure necessarily that doing those things still work the way that they worked for me but i would still say that if what you want to do is shoot live music you really need to practice 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 and the only way you're going to practice is to get into those small venues to get in with those small bands and if that band then starts to pick up steam and it starts going places hopefully they take you with them as long as you are a nice person a person that people like to have around then even if your photos aren't as good as this other person this other person might be not the nicest person to be around and they will always pick you over them yes it's true and reliable if you're reliable with deadlines and and that also reliable fast yes. yeah it's not only about photography to be a photographer and a successful one it's truly i th- i think you're so right it's about being friendly it's about yeah all the things you just named it's not just the one picture yeah i mean i think i've got a bit of a reputation now for being like the girl that's always like dancing along in the photo pit, singing along, <laughs> having a laugh, whatever. I mean, I never do it in a way that's going to get in anyone else's way or ruin anybody else's shots or whatever. But obviously, I'm a fan first and foremost. So if I'm shooting my favorite band, I will take a step to the back of the pit or the side of the pit out of everyone's way and have a little bit of a dance even if I have only got three songs because I love <laughs> <Beautiful>. my life. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll get people commenting on this podcast saying she's what's wrong with photographers you should not be dancing in the pit but like honestly stop being grouchy exactly you should <laughs> dance anywhere you like yeah. <laughs> especially if you like your job this much it's yeah. worth a dance i just think as long as it's not in anyone's way if you're just if you take a step back take a step to the side whatever like do you yes i totally agree that's beautiful <laughs> so I know you've got a lot on your plate in your preparation towards Eurovision and I know you've shot I mean you just talked about it with so much energy you've shot so many beautiful things throughout the years but if you could pick anything what would you want to shoot uh, that you haven't shot yet is there anything on your wish list I have a couple of things on my wish list um I have a bucket list of bands and I also have a bucket list of venues. Um so my band bucket list all that's left on that is Paramore and uh, Hosier. Two artists that I love. Hosier I've seen play a lot of times but because he's not in the kind of music sphere that I usually shoot in it's a little bit more difficult for me to get a pass. And then Paramore just because it's been a long time since they were last here i wasn't at the point in my career where i could shoot them the last time and then this time they weren't allowing photographers there were no photo passes for this tour so you know it was what it was but um so they're my two 
artists on my bucket list. And then in terms of venues, I would love, love, love to shoot at Red Rocks. It's a venue literally built into a canyon and the canyon is Red Rocks. So I just see bands playing there and I think, oh my gosh, I would love, 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 love to shoot in this venue. It's it's honestly, it's so beautiful. I highly recommend like looking at photos of it and stuff. And also another place for me, which is not as visually pleasing, but has a lot of history is Maida Vale Studios. So you know that picture of the Beatles crossing, the zebra crossing outside Abbey Road? Just around the corner is also Maida Vale Studios. Uh, they are both really iconic studios where lots of music has been recorded. So two venues and two bands that are left on my bucket list. And then I'm sure I will add to it. But right now, that's that's it. <laughs> that was exactly what I was going to say, is that knowing you now, just from this one episode and chatting to you and your energy, I'm pretty sure those four things are going to yeah, really be... Uh, Probably within, let me think, five years from now, they'll be crossed off. I'm <laughs> I sure. <hope> so. <laughs> While dancing. <laughs> What's on your bucket list? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I would love to go to Eurovision once more because that's been forever. I'm not going this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one I went to was uh, in Rotterdam, but it was a weird one because of COVID. So, oh, so you went I would to love to Got go you. later in. Yeah, cause, and Rotterdam is in my own country, so I would like I to go to one that's far there. away. <laughs> exactly mm. i want to go to another one there is a very good chance it could be it could be one of the uh nordic countries that wins this year um i mean the nordic countries always come with bangers anyway so, so when at your vision do you have a favorite country <laughs> see i'm not allowed to have a public opinion on what my favorite uh performances and countries are um ah, but bad. you know <laughs> i i will tell you that when I'm shooting, I'm singing along to all of them because they get in your brain. They're proper earworms, all of them. <laughs> and you end up yes, singing them <laughs> singing them for months to come. And they become part of your general vernacular. You know, last year there was a guy who was there for Romania and his song was called Ola Mi Bebebe. Be. And literally we walk into rooms and say to each other, Ola Mi Bebebe be is because... <laughs> It's just <laughs> ingrained, ingrained. Yep. Yeah, because you hear it the whole week and it's everywhere around you. Ah, that's what makes it beautiful. It's really a world on its own. Uh, good luck with preparing everything for your way there. And of course, yeah, have a lot of fun while there. And thanks so much for, uh, yeah, for taking the time to be on this episode because I know you're very busy preparing, but thanks so much. It was lovely. Uh, chatting to you thank you so much for having me and hopefully i will see you at a future eurovision yes that would yeah. be so amazing i would love that <laughs> <laughs> thanks corinne thanks thank you me. have fun there wow what an excellent guest and don't forget to check out corinne's work when you get a chance thanks again for listening to canon shutter stories come back next month for another episode and in the meantime don't be a stranger there are loads of brilliant ways to stay in contact with us in the podcast description. We also love to hear your feedback, so rate it five stars on the platform you listen on and spread the word with all of your favorite photographers and content creators. See you soon. Shutter Stories, a Canon podcast. <laughs>